One thing that I've learned, and one of the benefits to be preaching on Matthew in both the languages, English and Spanish, there's so many benefits, but I want to tell you two of them. The first one is when you speak a broken English, it forces you to pay attention more. <laughs> and that's awesome. And the second thing that I've seen through this gospel that now we're heading to chapter 27, almost one, two chapters left, 20, 28 is the last chapter, is how intentional Matthew has been to portray Jesus as our Lord, God, Savior, the Messiah, the King, promise, the promised King. And that is what we are talking about. That, that's what this is series is about, your kingdom come. So the portion we have today, it is a long portion, it's 26 verses, so I want you to open or turn on your Bible so we may navigate together in these 26 verses. If you have been here through the, throughout the series, you know where Matthew, Matthew is leading us. Matthew has been using the Old Testament to demonstrate that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah, that he is the promised king, that he is God that came and served his people and brought this kingdom in order to save the sinners. And weeks before, we learned that Jesus is now facing two different trials. The religious trials that was um, uh, set in three different trials, Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin. And now we are heading to the trial. The last phase of Jesus' trial is before the pilots the, um, the authority, the Roman authority, Pilot, Herod, Pilot. The last week we learned, and weeks before we learned, that Jesus was illegally judged by the religious leader. They forced, they violated all the laws that, uh, in order to have a legal trial against Jesus. Last week we, we learned how Peter denies Jesus according to, to Jesus' prophecy, and now we have Jesus before Pilate. Remember that now the religious leaders, in order to make this, this, this trial make it legal, they bring Jesus to Pilate. Remember that they were, let me give you some historical context. Remember that they were under the uh, rule of the Roman Empire. Therefore, they can't execute anyone. They can. They have to go and they have to do it through the civil laws as well. But also, on the other hand, remember that uh, Roman Empire, one of, the, one of their declaration was the Pax Romana. Pax Romana. And Pax Romana basically is this um, idea of uh, promote this authority having everybody under control, under authority, promoting a peace among their um, uh, town cities, whatever they were ruling over. I don't know if you remember that that's one of the goals of Pilate and Herod, to keep people in revolts in the lower, um, um, you know, very quiet. They don't want to deal with them. And that's what we have. So we have a pilot that they had dealing with revolts before, and he doesn't want more, more, more revolts. But also you have to understand that the religious leader, they are trying to force Pilate in order to judge Jesus. So when we read the text that we're going to read, let me give you what the, the idea that this text conveys. Matthew wants us to remind us that Jesus even though he's righteous and innocent, he's unfairly condemned to the cross. And the exchange between him and Barabbas serve as a picture of the gospel so we can see ourselves portrayed in that exchange. So we are talking about legal judgment. We are talking about trial let me give you then three evidence in which Jesus was righteous and yet was sentenced to death. And the title of the sermon is that, The Righteous, righteous and Condemned. So the first evidence is in the first ten verses. 
And we see it through the scandalous truth of the betrayer. The scandalous truth of the betrayer. Read with me verse 1 to 10. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have seen by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasure, since it's blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's fields, the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, and prize of him on whom a prize had been set by someone of the son of Israel, and they gave them the potter's field as the Lord direct, directed them. I, I like the last verses because it shows a couple of things that are important for us as a Christian before we dive in into the point. Is that first, the scripture is sufficient. And Matthew is, again, teaching us that what is happening here is according to what God ordained. God is directing this. It's important. So it may it help us to see God as the sovereign one who is directing this, according to verse 10. But Matthew, intentionally, he continues to connect this text with the prophecies about the Messiah. And as you see, the trial happened overnight. So it was against the law, as we saw a couple weeks ago. And here we have the chief priests and the elders of the Jewish people, the Sanhedrin, taking Jesus to Pilate. What was the purpose of that? They want to put Jesus to death. They don't want negotiation. They don't want to to deal with other uh, prophets that uh, that threat their leadership among the Jewish people. And it was the third and final phase of the civil trial. And Matthew only teaches, and Matthew only only, only writes about that. But if you you harmonize the other gospel, you will notice that Pilate sent Jesus to Herod, and Herod sent him back to Pilate. So we are here. But in between, Matthew does something very interesting. I don't know if you noticed. He then inserts what happened with with Judas. He's the only gospel that includes Judas' death. And I was wondering, why? Why did Matthew want to narrate the death of Judas in the midst of the Pilate judgment? In fact, as I mentioned, only Matthew record this. But what you see what happened with Judas, make it clear why Matthew insert, insert this. If you follow all the chapter 26 and every, the, the direction we are heading, you will notice that in chapter 26, the religious leader, they try hard. They strive in order to find one single accusation against Jesus. So you got to follow that thought of line because now when Judas, the betrayer, he saw that Jesus was condemned, he said that he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of of silver to the chief priests and the elders. And he says, I have seen betraying innocent blood. The betrayer confession is another evidence that Matthew wants us to see that Jesus was righteous. This is a scandalous truth, of course, because after that, instead of him repent of it, he just killed himself. But I think that Matthew wants to convey that Jesus is heading to the cross as an innocent man. What happened with Judas? 
We know many things. We can infer a lot of things. But I think that he realized the true intentions of the false religious leaders. He saw how they sought to put Jesus to death. He realized the atrocity of his betrayal. His betrayal sent Jesus to the cross, and he knew that Jesus would be executed on the cross. He acknowledged that he had sinned against God. He realized that money, that the money that he received couldn't solve the problem triggered by sin. The money he longed for couldn't help him now. And when the religious leaders um, saw that, and, and, and he, I think that he ran to the wrong place. He went to the religious leaders looking for a solution for his sins, and he found nothing. The religious leader had no capacity to respond to the problem of sin. And observe the way they respond. Verse 4. They said, what is that to us? See to yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. And then they decided what to do to the money. Let me clarify something in the text. Some people think that they don't want to use the money because yeah, Judas went and hanged hang himself. They didn't know it in that moment. They knew it that Judas was under curse because the law says that in Deuteronomy 27. And they can use that money because it's a blood money in order to use it in the temple. And you know what is that? Hypocrisy. Again, they are displaying the hypocrisy as a false religious leaders. So Judas... Not knowing what to do with his remorse, Judah decided to take his own life. And moreover, Judas knew also that the law condemned him. Let me read with you, probably you have it on the screen, of not, if you don't have it, take notes, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 27, 25. It says, Cursed be anyone who takes a bride to shed Innocent blood. So he has the weight of the law. He knew that he was sinning against God. He knew that he took the bride, bribe. He knew that he, he felt the weight of his sin. So he felt the remorse of his conscience. He felt the condemnation of the law. And even worse, he didn't see how, to, how he could be forgiven. Because the leaders were indifferent to his sin. His pain didn't lead him to repentance, unfortunately. I don't know if you know that there is a sorrow that leads to salvation. And there is a sorrow that leads to death. I don't know if you know that the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 10, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly, worldly grief produces death. And that's what happened with Judas. He didn't repent. He felt the guilt, the condemnation of the law. The, the law was condemning him. He didn't find hope. And the religious leader now neither. And that's why he took his life. He took his own life. But we shouldn't stop here because I know it's a sad story. But Judas' death and his declaration is what make this point important. It's not just Judas' death. It's not just the fact that he killed himself, but what he recognized. And Judas recognized that Jesus was innocent. Remember, if you go back a couple of verses, you will notice that there was a whole force against Jesus. Religious leaders as a detective trying to find any single way to accuse Jesus. Any single fault. And they couldn't. Enemy, demons, Satan trying to find any single spot against this holy 
and righteous man. And now Judas, recognizing that Jesus is innocent, is also a declaration that confirms that Jesus' life was perfect. The betrayer stated that Jesus is innocent, and this is important because that man who is going to be crucified is a righteous man. He's a righteous man, and that's important, brothers. Because when you understand that, probably some of us, we are striving to be perfect. Probably you, you deal and you struggle with perfectionism. And sometimes we, we try to be perfect in our faith. And you know, you know what? You're going to fail. But the only, there's one person who lived a perfect life. And because of his perfection, because of his sinless life, now, those who believe in him will be found, what, righteous, perfect. It's a good news, isn't it? What we can learn from Judas, many things, but also we can learn a lot about sin. Sin blinds us, brothers and sisters. Sin blinds us. Sin dulls us. Sin will take you beyond you were intended to go. Sin will come back to destroy you. Sin will cost you more than you wanted to pay. Judas went to the religious leaders, probably looking for a solution, but he went to the wrong place. Because no one in this world can solve the issue, the problem of sin. There's just one person, and Jesus Christ, isn't he? Jesus Christ is the one who came to remove sin and the guilt of it. Also, I, I want to highlight something, how this narrative further reveals the cruelty of the religious leaders who value the laws of, of ritual purity more than their own responsibility to human life. You saw it when they say, we can take this money to honor God. Hypocrites. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, they are not different from some Christians today, that they are more concerned with the insignificant rules of the church as opposed to the important matters of the community. What else we learn? Well, I think that we learn that you may have seen, you may feel remorse, and still not repent. And you know what? You will find death. Like Peter, we saw last week, and Corey told us about this. Peter, like Peter, Judas is guilty of denying and betraying Jesus. While Peter's remorse leads to repentance, Judas' remorse leads to terminal hopelessness. And again, 2 Corinthians 7, godly grief produces repentance. Remorse is not a way out of sin. Repentance is. The problem of sin is solved only through Jesus Christ, who came to take away the sin of this world, to take away the guilt of our sins. Are you dealing and struggling with guilt? Do you, do you struggle with that? Jesus came to remove that as well. And you want to know why? Because he doesn't change. And his love is unshakable. His love covers our sins and the guilt of it. That's what he came for. He said, repent. The kingdom of God is here. If you, like Judas and Peter, sin against God, the holy, holy, holy God, Jesus is the only one capable to forgive your sin and remove the guilt of it. So... Judas' betrayal uh, ended up providing and proving, proving, providing evidence and proving that Jesus is the sinless lamb. So if you are here, look at the sinless lamb, not to yourself. Also, if you are here and you are considering taking your life as Judah did, either because you feel guilty, either you feel your life is meaningless, or you feel like you're, you are worthless, that's not truth. That's not truth. Don't lose the sight. Don't do what, don't, don't do what Judas did. 
Look what he said first. Jesus is innocent, and the innocent, innocent one took the place on the guilty, so that those who are guilty may believe in him, and they will be declared righteous. If you need help, come to us. If you are thinking or struggling with the idea, come to us, and we will love to help and lead you to the cross. So there is purpose in Christ, there is hope, there is forgiveness in Christ. No matter how deep your sin has taken you, Christ still forgives those who run to him. That's the first evidence. The scandalous truth of the betrayer. Second evidence. In which Jesus was righteous and yet was sentenced to death. The accurate verdict of whom? The governor. The accurate verdict. Read verse 11 to 19. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you, do you, do, do you not hear how many things they testified against you? But he gave him no answer, not even a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. You can see, you can be amazed by Jesus and be lost. Now, at the feast of the, at the feast, because we were in the Passover, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner who they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas. Or Jesus, who is the called Christ, who is called Christ. For they, he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with these righteous men. For I have suffered much before of him today in a dream. You know, Pilate is a governor of Judea. And Herod in Galilee, Galilea, yeah, you know in English, I know in Spanish, Galilea. <laughs> so Pilate was, was a governor between the 26th and 36th AD. And according to Josephus, there were so many uprisings against Pilate. So many. And now since the accusation of blasphemy meant nothing for the Romans' authority. What they did, the religious leaders, they fabricated political accusation to justify his death. So the civil trial began, and Pilate interrogates and noted that something that he was doing, he was doing what he was supposed to do, ask questions. What accusation do you bring against this man? And the religious leaders, they were interested on in what? On executing Jesus in the most shameful manner possible for any Sinner, and that manner was the crucifixion. But they were moved by what? Envy. Pilate knew it. And look how their false accusation evolved. Look at the first, you remember they, they were willing to bribe false witness in chapter 26. Do you remember that? And what happened in chapter 26, verse 61? They found two witnesses, false witnesses. They paid for it, and they said this, I am able to destroy the temple, they said, the, the, the false witness. I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And they said, wow, this is, this is an accusation. This is, we got it, we got it. But they knew that it wasn't enough, so they persisted they persist to, and they pushed more Jesus. And one of the, the, the religious leaders said, I adjure you to, by the living God, tells us, if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest, he made a drama. He just, he just tore his robes and said, he has ordered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? So you notice that the first false witnesses wasn't enough? So from the destruction of the temple accusation, now there it evolved to blasphemy. But that's not all. If you read the title of the text in John 18, for instance, 
He was accused to be evil. When they came to Pilate and Pilate said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, if these men were not doing evil. The problem that they knew they had no right to, to murder because they were under Roman occupation. And Roman have, they have the right, but they need evidence to do it. So what they do, what they do, they lie again. They lied again. And if, you, if you read John 18, verse 31 says that Pilate, Pilate t- told them, take him yourself and judge him by your own law. And the Jews said, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Do you see their motivations? You see their motivation? So now they presented to Jesus with another false accusation. What do you see in the text? Well, when Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Where do you think he came from? (laughs) Where do you think that this title of the king of the Jews came from? Well, you need to read Luke 23. Let me read it for you. And Luke 23 says, then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding, forbidding us to give tri- tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ a king. Wow, that's a, that's a strong accusation. Because if you know that someone else called himself king, it's an insurrection against Caesar, who's the king. He claimed to be God as well. So they made up this accusation. They evolved this accusation. The original accusation has been modified to incriminate Jesus as a political rebel. So Pilate interrogated him. Pilate knew everything, and he knew that they were moved by envy. Do you see how destructive envy could be? Have you noticed how destructive envy, envy could be? It destroyed lives, it destroyed relationships, it destroyed families, it destroyed churches. So Pilate begins the interrogation. Are you the king of the Jews? But he's not limited to that question, another question. The Gospel of John tells us more about the questions that Pilate asked. John 18, 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again, and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, do you say this for your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? Of course. Others told him. Luke told us. Who told him? And Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests told me. They have delivered you over to me. But tell me, Jesus. What have you done? Verse 36, John 18, and Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I may not be delivered over the, to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. And then Pilate said to him, so kingdom, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. And let me tell you something else that can save your life, Pilate. For this purpose, I was born, and for this purpose, I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. And listen to me, Pilate, and first Irving. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Hmm. Pilate didn't get it. And Pilate said to him, what is the truth? And after he has said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilty in him. Let me tell you, Pilate had never been closer to knowing the truth than at that moment. It's like many of us and many of you probably visitors who came to the church and you're amazed with Jesus and you hear the truth and you are too close to the truth. But you know what? You go outside lost 
Because unless you believe that Jesus is what he said, that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and you confess that him is your Lord and Savior, you are lost. What was the pilot accurate verdict? Read it. I find no guilty of him. I find no guilty of him. The betrayer and the governor had something in common. They found Jesus righteous. Can you see it? But someone else knew that Jesus was righteous. Who was? Pilate's wife. Read verse 19. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with the righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. You see, husbands, our wives are always right. <laughs> uh, you like it, that. But you know that's not true. <laughs> now Judas Pilate announced Pilate's wife had something in common. They found Jesus innocent, righteous. And that's what Matthew's trying to communicate. He was righteous and yet was sentenced to death. That innocent was confirmed by the words of, that innocence was confirmed by the words of Judah, by the better of Pilate and by, Pilate, by Pilate's wife. And this reminds us that Jesus lived the perfect life that you and me would, we wouldn't be able to live. That is demonstrated again that his perfection confirms that he's God. Because only God is what? Perfect. And that, that's, that's why we say that this is a new, new, good news of the gospel. Because he lived a life we were not able to live. He fulfilled the standard that we were not able to fulfill. And now those who believe in him will find righteous. That's something unbelievable. Jesus is a lamb without blemish. He's innocent. And Peter knew in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, he said, Knowing that you were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. That's the second evidence in which, we, in, in which Jesus was right and yet was sentenced to death. The accurate verdict of the governor was the last evidence. Hmm. I don't know if I can finish this without being, you know. But the beautiful exchange for the sinner. The beautiful exchange of the sinner. Read verse 20 to 26. Now the chief priests and the elders persuade the crowd. They couldn't persuade, persuade completely the pilot. So they persuade the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with this Jesus who's called Christ? They all said, all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? Pilate was confused. Why? And also, of course, he has the pressure of his wife. Don't lose that. Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his, washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent. You were not, Pilate. I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, look at this. His blood be on us and our, on our children. And then he released for them Barabbas and having a scourge, Jesus delivered him to be crucified. The religious leaders couldn't completely persuade Pilate, but they went to the crowd. Be careful with the crowd. Be careful with the crowd. Try not to be lost in the crowd. 
fragile change according to the ten trends. And the response of the crowd surprised Pilate. But Pilate insisted second time, third time. And I don't know if you noticed that Pilate is not a godly man. He's used to this. He used to lead trial and condemn people to the cross. But they know, he know that this was, this was a righteous man. And Pilate's persistence confirms Jesus is not guilty. What happened to Pilate? Probably fears of men. Fear to the multitude in spite of fear of God. Fear of men. And instead of being a man of authority, he fear of men. He feel the crowd. He loves more his position and reputation. He wants to ev ev evade that responsibility because of his fears. But he couldn't. The people respond blindly, foolishly, and stubbornly. His blood be on us and our children. And you know the story. Next week we're going to continue to talk about what happened with Jesus. But something special, something special happened in this moment. And I want you to keep your mind, your eyes, your heart, and what happened is this beautiful exchange. This beautiful and glorious exchange between Barabbas and Jesus Christ. Jesus, the holy and the righteous one, take the place of the sinners like Barabbas and receive all the wrath of God in our place so that those who believe in him as Lord and Savior do not receive the wrath of God, do not receive condemnation. You know what? This is a beautiful exchange because we all are Barabbas. We all are Barabbas. And Jesus, the Holy One, took our spot in the cross. So now, those who are guilty like us, those who are sinners like us, when we look at Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then we'll be declared righteous. You and me, we don't deserve that. You don't deserve that. Second Corinthians, Paul, in the second letter to the Corinthians church, he's, he wrote that in chapter 5. For our sake, he made himself, he made him to be seen, who knew no sin, that in him, in him, not in any religious, not in any other name, not in any church, not in any work or duty we do, not in any how many years you have in church, but in him. We may become the righteousness of God. Let me tell you what happened in the future. Let me tell you what will happen with you when you pass away. Let me tell you what will happen. If you are in Christ, you're going to come to heaven. And you will find yourself, you said, I don't know what I'm here. And God will say, come my righteous son, my righteous daughter. Why? Why, Jesus? I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't righteous. I know, but there's one who took your spot in the cross, and because of him, I declare you, because you surrender your life to his lordship, you believe that he was your savior, because of him, come, my righteous men and women. We are declared righteous not because of our merits, but Jesus' merits. That's a wonderful good news. And everyone in this room, you may be in peace still because Jesus fulfilled what you, were, you weren't able to do. If you are visiting today, I hate this clock. <laughs> if you are here today, there is a question that Pilate did, and I want to ask the same question to you. Pilate, Pilate asked this question. What 
should I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? The same question to you. If you're visiting because your mom, your dad brought you, if you're a student, you have been here for years, and you have no idea about Jesus, if you have this intellectual idea of Jesus, the same question is for you. What should you do with the Jesus, who's the Christ, who's God, the King, the Messiah, the Savior? And let me tell you, the way you respond to that question will change drastically where you're going to spend eternity. What should you do? Let me give you an advice. Let me tell you what you must do. You must repent of your sin because you are like Barabbas. You must run to Christ. You must recognize you like Judas and Barabbas and the crowd. You have sinned against a holy God. There's a good news. You can come and confess your sins to him and accept that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one will come to the Father if you don't come through Jesus Christ. Run to him as your only hope and Savior and surrender to you his lordship. And may God help you.